I'm Dr. Daniel Little, assistant professor of digital media studies at the University of Maryland. I'm Amy Higginbrader Goodman, associate professor of Humanities. On behalf of the Social Justice Committee here at Maryland, welcome to everyone joining our guest lecture series, The Life and Times of Adele Butler. With us tonight is Dr. Beverly Bradshaw, an eminent scholar, researcher, and activist who will over who will offer insight and content to Bell Hooks' tireless, fearless race and gender critique within the academy and in women's rights movements. Dr. Beverly Bradshaw is Anna Julia Cooper, Professor of Media, Professor of Williams Women's Studies at Bell Hooks. She is also a founding director of the Women's Research and Resource Center, the first women's research center in the HBCU, and the first to offer a Dr. Guy Shanto has published a number of texts within African American and women's studies, which have been noted as seminal works by other scholars, including the first anthology on Black women's literature, sturdy Black women, visions of Black women in literature, daughters of sorrow, attributes toward Black women in history, attitudes toward Black women, 1890 to 1920, and her most recent an anthology edited by Lynetta Nicole, who should be first sending students out on the 2008 presidential campaign. In 1983, Dr. Guy Sheffield became a founding co editor of SAVE, a scholarly journal of Black women devoted exclusively to the experiences of women in African history. She's the past president of the National Women's Studies Association and was recently elected to the American Academy of Arts. In her role, I hope you all can hear me because I couldn't hear you all. We can hear you. Oh, you can hear me. Okay. Am I better uh, on this gallery view or not? You're perfect. I'm, I'm okay. Yeah, okay. Yeah, you're okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I like the joint uh, uh, introduction here. So let, let, me, let me just start by thanking the social justice program at University of Maryland Eastern Shore. And I want to especially thank Jawanda for uh, getting me here. And I want to acknowledge my, I was going to say old, but I, I'm, I don't want to really say old, uh, my former uh, Professor Marshall Stevenson, my former colleague at uh, Dillard University. And uh, it's really, really good to see you all. So I'm going to get, I'm going to get started. I'm going to start with a a, a quote that I like very much, and then just get right into the uh, the uh, talk, the life and times of, of Bell Hooks. So here's the quote. Dissidents, D-I-S-S-I-D-E-N-T-S, -S -S, are anchored to revolutionary possibilities that demand both intellectual discipline and irrepressible courage to speak the unspeakable to stand alone if necessary, and to accept the material and emotional consequences of tramping over hegemony's holy ground. That's Antonia Darda, 2011. I was reminded while reading Darda's riveting anthology, A Dissident Voice, Essays in Culture, pedagogy and power of teachers, scholars, activists, feminists, colleagues, dissidents who emerged from marginalized and racialized communities in the US and impacted my intellectual life in significant ways. None more so than Bell Hooks with whom I shared a 40 year friendship. It is important, I think, 
to embrace the dissident women among us, so often maligned and misunderstood. For four decades, Bell Hooks' dissenting voice in her writing and teaching and speaking has been loud and unrelenting. Beginning with the publication of her first book, Ain't I a Woman, Black Women in Feminism, followed by, to just name a few, and there were over 30, Feminist Theory from Margin to Center, The Will to Change, Men, Masculinity, and Teaching to Transgress. One of the most prolific and radical contemporary Black feminist scholar activists, Bell Hooks' Talking Back, Talking Thinking Feminist, Thinking Black, provides a portrait of a dissident Black intellectual whose untimely death at age 69 this past December generated perhaps the most commentary that I recall ever having read when a Black academic woman departed us. This is how Bell explained her choosing the name Bell Hooks and the legacy of her dissident great-grandmother. I was a young girl buying bubble gum at the corner store when I first heard the full name Bell Hooks. I had just talk back to a grown person. Even now, I can recall the surprised look, the mocking tones that informed me, I must be kin to Bell Hooks, a sharp-tongued woman, a woman who spoke her mind, a woman who was not afraid to talk back. I claimed this legacy of defiance, of will, of courage, affirming my link to female ancestors who are bold and daring in their speech. Bell Hooks, as I discovered, claimed and invented was my ally, my support. That was in talking back. My friendship with Gloria Watkins, she was not yet Bell Hooks, began at the 1981 National Women's Studies Association Conference in Storrs, Connecticut, during which Audre Lorde delivered a groundbreaking, hard-hitting keynote speech, the uses of anger, women responding to racism. It was the same year that the Women's Research and Resource Center at Spelman College was founded. Gloria, eventually Bell Hooks, was promoting her first book, Ain't I a Woman, Black Women and Feminism. We shared a dormitory room, talked all night the first day we met, and continued to talk until her untimely death this past December at, at age 69. I did not realize then why we spent that first night talking in my dorm room all night and why we would continue talking for the next four decades. Later, I came to realize it was our memories of dissident women in our respective families and our passionate connection to Black feminist politics. I will return to my personal encounter with Gloria Bell a little later. The first feminist I ever knew was my mother. Though she would not have used that term, her words and deeds were undeniably feminist. I have no explanation for this, since Ernestine Varnado Guy was born in Canton, Mississippi in 1919 to a stay-at-home mom and a traditional Baptist minister. Frustrated as a math teacher in the Memphis public schools, she chose to work in the male-dominated field of accounting in the business office of a black college where her brother-in-law, Dr. Levi Watkins Jr., Levi Watkins Sr., was president. Her love of math and work choices occurred long before the contemporary women's liberation movement in the US, 
as was her advocacy of gender equity in the workplace or the need for girls to have greater access to STEM disciplines. When I was in the eighth grade, she left my father and moved with her three daughters close by to live with her parents. While she never fulfilled her professional goal of becoming a certified public accountant, probably because of the demands of being a single mom, she always preached to her three daughters the importance of pursuing one's dreams, even if they remain elusive. The most memorable example of mom's loud resistance to race and gender scripts, probably like Bell Hooks's namesake, took place in 1958 when I was in the ninth grade and the Memphis public schools were controlled by white men. Bothered by conventional gender norms that position females as first of all homemakers, she petitioned the Memphis public schools to waive their home economics requirements for girls and demanded that I take typing, which was reserved for juniors and seniors who were presumably headed for clerical jobs. Men were required to take auto mechanics and shop. This act of defiance on my mother's part sent several clear messages to me as a young girl that learning to be a homemaker was not as important as preparing for a career, that the skills of a typist would be more useful to a college bound student, and that black women could actually resist white patriarchal authority, even in the Jim and Jane Crow South. Her petition was granted, so I may have been the first Memphis public school girl to escape obligatory homemaking classes. Following the example of my mother, I developed the habit of talking back, which girls were discouraged from doing, as was the same with bell hooks. What I came to cherish about the embrace of a dissident feminist identity, I learned from reading and talking endlessly to Gloria, which began that night at NWSA. Like dissident Angela Davis and the architects of the Combahee River Collective, Bell Hooks emerges from a robust African-American left tradition which is anti-capitalist, anti-imperialist, and critical of heteropatriarchy. Bell Hooks's transgressive writings would have a significant impact on my own evolving scholarship. In her first monograph on Black women and feminism, Ain't I a Woman? She makes the surprising point that 19th century white female reformers harbored more intense racist attitudes toward black women than they did toward black men, which is ironic in light of the so-called bonds of womanhood thesis, which many white feminist historians advanced in their attempts to explain alliances between black and white women in various reform movements. Hooks argued that it was fear of contamination and sexual competition that caused white women to resist cooperation with black women, including in women's mobilizations during the so-called second wave of the women's movement. In her second book, Feminist Theory from Margin to Center, published in 1984, now widely used in women's studies classes, there is a hard hitting analysis of the insensitivity of women's studies programs in the early years to race, class, and ethnicity. This is one of the things she said. White women who dominate feminist discourse, who for the most part make and articulate feminist theory, have little or no understanding of white supremacy as a racial politic, of the psychological impact of class, of their political status within a racist, sexist, capitalist state. If I could speak to Belle one more time, I would tell her what it meant to share a long friendship with a dissident 
writer, professor. Observing her and reading her feminist books, as well as having the example of my mother and her great grandmother, I found it easier to resist stifling gender norms in both my personal and professional lives as it related to appropriate behavior for so-called good or ladylike women. I journeyed to distant and unfamiliar places, wore the clothes I wanted to wear, wrote the books I wanted to write, studied the transgressive black women I wanted to be like, Lorraine Hansberry, Alice Walker, Angela Davis, Audre Lorde, took unpopular stances, refused to be quiet in public, risked being understood, chose the friendships and partnerships I desired, advocated loudly for my passions. Fears I might have harbored about being too aggressive or even the stereotypical angry black woman or gender non-conforming had to be abandoned. I am fortunate to have lived the life I wanted to live. Like so many of us, I am grateful to Bell Hooks for her example. I want to move toward closure by reflecting briefly upon Bell's books about love, which sometimes people see as very different than her radical black feminist texts. I began with a quote from All About Love, New Visions, published in 2000, the year 2000. If I were asked to define myself, she said, I wouldn't start with race. I wouldn't start with blackness. I wouldn't even start with gender. I wouldn't start with feminism. I would start with stripping down to what fundamentally informs my life, which is that I am a seeker on the path. I think of feminism and I think of anti-racist struggle as part of it, but where I stand spiritually is steadfastly on a path about love. Perhaps the most cogent testimony about the power of love and its healing and political ingredients is this, this is Bell. Love redeems despite all the lovelessness that surrounds us. Nothing has been able to block out our longing for love, the intensity of our yearning. The healing power of redemptive love lures us and calls us toward the possibility of healing. Like all great mysteries, we are all mysteriously called to love, no matter the conditions of our lives, the degree of our depravity or despair. The persistence of this call gives us reason to hope. Without hope, we cannot return to love. It is a practice of positive thinking. Living in a permanent state of hopelessness renews the spirit. I am also remembering Professor Gary Lemon's loving, heartwarming, compelling anthology, Hooked on the Art of Love, Bell Hooks and My Calling or Soul Work, in which he and his contributors make visible the revolutionary artistry of Bell Hooks. And this is Gary Lemons. As a Black male teacher, scholar, and artist, whose commitment to social justice and human rights is rooted in the groundbreaking works of Hooks, I am a witness to the liberatory power of her creative genius and giftedness. Over the course of time, I have been led in her words and works to embark upon a journey for expressing creativity of a soul struggling to self-actualize. In line with Hooks's life-changing vision of a beloved community, I have conceptualized this book. He means the one he's editing. I have conceptualized this book as a radical model for self-liberation. Thus, in loving communion with Bell, together 
the contributors and I actively labor toward re-envisioning the world we must make if we are to be one with the planet, one healing heart, giving and sustaining life. Love is our hope and our salvation. In my own recent praise songs to Belle, I argue that she has been the most unrelenting, hard hitting, caring, passionate black feminist voice with respect to the ravages of white supremacist patriarchy and toxic masculinities. There were a particular set of circumstances, as I mentioned, that helped to illuminate my 40 year friendship, comradeship with her. Again, it began in 1981 at that infamous conference in stores. This women's studies conference signaled a major political shift in the field of women's studies. And it was people like Bell Hooks and Audre Lorde which forced that shift. My encounter with Gloria was casual and serendipitous on that first day. In fact, we were just walking on the campus and bumped into her. Though I had no idea who she was, I learned later that she was born in 1952, six years after me, in the little town of Hopkinsville, Kentucky. We had similar academic profiles. She obtained degrees in English from Stanford University, the University of Wisconsin, and UC Santa Cruz. My degrees in English were from Spelman, Atlanta University, and eventually American Studies from Emory University, where I focused on lit and history. We were also raised in the Jim and Jane Crow South. She was promoting her first book, Ain't I a Woman, and was literally, and, and we literally bumped into each other. One of the things that is amazing and I share with my students is she didn't even have enough resources to have a, have a, a, a hotel, or, or which is how she ended up in my room. She had nowhere to stay. Because she didn't have a dormitory room, I said, you can come into my room, you can have my little raggedy twin bed and I'll sleep on the floor. We talked all night and that was the beginning of the most important political friendship of my personal and professional life. It was also a loving partnership. It would have been impossible for us to have imagined over the next several days at the conference that her feminist books, which were to grow to be almost 40, would help to transform the field of women's studies or that we would stay bonded forever. Over the years, she became our most frequent guest at the Women's Center and spoke mostly without an honorary. During her visits, she developed a loving connection with our students, many of whom remember those days with fondness as they reflect upon her impact in the aftermath of her untimely death this past December. After leaving Stores, Connecticut that weekend, we continue to delve deeply into Black feminist matters via long telephone calls and during my frequent visits to her tiny apartment at Yale University, where she had a five-year non-tenure track appointment in African-American studies. We would talk for hours and days about the joys and lessons of feminism and the reluctance of too many black women to embrace its radical politics or its potential for transforming black communities around patriarchal norms and values. We wanted our sisters and our brothers to love feminism as Gary Lemons came to do as a healing and critical political project that might address what ailed us as a nation and community. It is imperative, I would argue right now, that young women and men in particular hear from us and read our books. Words of Fire, an anthology of African-American feminist thought is the most visible testimony to my relationship with Gloria. These narratives, might provide clearer roadmaps, fewer detours, more carefully crafted destinations to the creation of a better, more loving world. For me, this has been a deeply satisfying journey from the quiet, 
shy, loner bookworm, as I used to be, to the feminist intellectual committed to sharing different stories about two of the most important liberation struggles of the 20th century, the civil rights and women's movements. Bell Hooks was certainly one of the most influential architects with respect to gendering the civil rights movement and challenging the whiteness of the mainstream women's movement. As a professor, writer, and critic, she has been one of the most cogent and passionate witnesses in her dissection of US culture, which she describes, of course, as white supremacist capitalist patriarchy. Her articulation of a love ethic in three books, all about love, salvation, and communion, gestures toward a powerful antidote to the, nature, to the nation's lovelessness. My final note to Belle is simple. And I'm writing this to her though she is not here. I have loved your relentless efforts, mainly with pen and speech, to imagine a different world and remain hopeful. I am also hopeful about the vitality of feminism when I see young black girls writing open letters to rap artists about the toxic misogynistic nature of too many of their images. I am ecstatic when I see feminist and queer black women catalyzing a Black Lives Matter movement in the aftermath of Ferguson. I am joyous when I see women in the streets of Italy Egypt, the Ivory Coast, and Libya, making, risking their lives in the pursuit of their own liberation. I smile when I ponder the example of my own mother, the feminist who raised me and my two sisters. I am exhilarated by the memory of our fallen sisters without whose struggles for a better world, we would not be in the place we are. I'm thinking about the legendary Sojourner Truth, Anna Julia Cooper, Ida Wells Barnett, Lorraine Hansberry, Polly Murray, Coretta Scott King, Audre Lorde, June Jordan, and I could name many, many more. I am grateful for the feminist work of the African-American Policy Forum, founded by professors Kimberly Crenshaw and Luke Harris whose interventions in male-centered racial justice initiatives need our continued support, especially around recent vicious right-wing attacks on critical race theory. I love you, Gloria Bell. Thank you so much. That was uh, riveting somewhat speechless. <laughs> you, you covered so much ground. Um, and you started talking about some things relative to a question that I wanted to ask is it seems like, and if you could speak a little bit to what was happening in the late seventies so that the center was formed, you and Betty and Roseanne came out with your book and then she came out with her book. It's like everything just kind of came together and that was the beginning of something. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, so I, I, I think if, if I were to do it chronologically, let's say that there was a Black women's literary renaissance, Black women's literary renaissance in the, in the mid 60s and late 60s coming out of actually the civil rights movement. And I'm thinking about if, if, if I had to right now do a chronology, I would say Tony Cape Mambera's Black woman book in 1970. I would say Alice Walker's Third Life of Grange Coker and her first volume of poetry, um, first and second. So there's a black women's literary renaissance in the 60s and 70s. But one of the things that was unfortunate, which is why I did Sturdy Black Bridges, we still had a, had a masculinist narrative, a, a, a narrative that's focused on black men in our envisioning of, of, of African, African American literature. Which, which was consistent with what happened in the late 19th century. For example, even though Anna Julia Cooper and Ida Wells Barnett 
were part of a robust African-American intellectual tradition, their names did not get mentioned when we think about the late 19th century. We think about William Du Bois, William e. Du Bois and Booker T. Washington. And I'll just give one little mind example of that. I grew up in Memphis, Tennessee, while Ida Wells started her anti-lynching campaign, and I never heard of Ida Wells. Th throughout even my four years at, at um, Spelman College. I also had never heard of Anna Julia Cooper. I was in a doctoral program at Emory University one night working on something, a paper, and you know how back then you, could, you would go in the stacks. And my hand reached up and I pulled a book down and it was Anna Julia Cooper's A Voice from the South written in 1892. I sat there, I was speechless, you all. I read that book from cover to cover. In fact, I hardly got home that night. So, so I said, how, how, how can we have these black women intellectuals like Anna G. Cooper and Ida Wells and they're not in, 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 in the history? So I was determined, Marshall, as were many other uh, black women historians and intellectuals in the 60s and 70s that we would rewrite, rewrite African-American political, literary, intellectual history and make sure that it was gender inclusive. And so uh, Mary Helen Washington started talking about black women writers. Uh, uh, Betty Parker Smith, whom you know, of course, as the uh, eventual provost of, of Dillard and Tougaloo, and I uh, co-edited with Roseanne Bell, Sturdy Black Bridge, Bridges, Visions of Black Women in Literature. And for that anthology, this was probably the most pivotal experience for me other than meeting Bell Hooks. Uh, Tony K. Bear had moved to Atlanta and I had read her book, The Black Woman, and was mesmerized by it. And I went to her house to interview her. I was young, I was scared. I didn't even know how to operate my little uh, tape recorder. But interviewing her, basically what she said, it's okay to be a black feminist a black nationalist, a black internationalist. It's okay to be committed to racial liberation and women's liberation. And so you had the emergence of this really amazing black feminist intellectual tradition. And these, these women were, were, you know, these women were among us. And so that is the, that is the context in which um, Bell Hooks came to, to, to women's studies where Audre Law was there. And what we talked about was the erasure of black women in women's studies and also in black studies. And so I would say that the emergence of these black feminist intellectuals, writers, artists, uh, people like Alice who wrote that text on womanism trying to bring us into a feminist space is the context for, for all of this work. And how Bell managed to write 30 books, 30 to 40 books, uh, in this mix uh, is 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 really amazing. I don't know if that if that answers. Oh, that was excellent. Thank you. Yes. Yes. If anyone has a question, um, you can raise your hand, and our co-host here will unmute you, so you can ask your question. You, let me say one other thing. Um, it's it, it's it's it, it maybe it's not possible for a younger audience to realize uh, what a demonized category of black feminism was in the seventies and eighties. I mean, uh, uh, it, it was it was not easy to to self define and to be an out black feminist. You were accused of being divisive, anti male lesbian, angry, unattractive. And so um, people like Bell Hooks, you know, were, were in, in, in initially accused of, as was Anita Hill, accused of, 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 of being uh, too attached to white feminists. And so this is one of the things I think it's important to remember as we think about this history. Uh, that that it was it was not easy to be an out black feminist in the seventies and eighties, and I could you know uh, talk about some of the attacks, the attacks on people like Michelle Wallace, 
and Intersaki Shange, and even on, on uh, Toni Morrison's uh, uh, book, The uh, Bluest Eye. So, you know, we, we, you know, we're sitting in these spaces now in the year 2022, where I think it's safe to say that Black feminism is not as demonized a category, but it took 30 years to get here. And one of the things I say about Bell Hooks, she really, she was really committed to um, uh, uh, enabling young boys and black men to understand the importance of, of, of a black feminist politics and the importance of moving away from heteropatriarchal uh, gender norms. And that's why I mentioned Gary Lemons, who's probably been her, been the, the black male scholar who's been most committed to uh, analyzing her work. I can't hear you all. I, I can hear you, Marshall, but I can't hear the rest of you too well. Does this work? Yeah, that works. Okay, great. I just wanted to ask, um, you had talked about uh, that part of her philosophy being like a seeker on a path, um, that idea of the love ethic. Um, and I think it's, it's, it's a really interesting one. I'm not as familiar with that as that idea of talking back, which I'm so enamored with. But I'm, as I'm listening to you talk about it, I wonder if it's sort of two sides of the same coin that you, and I just was wondering if you could, if you could maybe help me work through that or if I'm, if, 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 if there's some resonance there. Well, you know, one, one of the things, one, one of the things that, that, that is true is, is uh, Bell had a very deep spiritual practice, which was basically Buddhist. Uh, she, she remained a Christian, as, as, as did uh, Alice Walker, but she had a very uh, deep spiritual practice. And within the context of her spiritual practice, uh, she um, imagined love as, as a, not, not the emotional, <laughs> romantic uh, concept, but in many ways, as Martin Luther King imagined the beloved com community. In other words, love, love is a political, radical, healing, regenerative process. And she believed that it was a process. She also believed, that, 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 that despite her deep commitment to, to political transformation, she did not believe that, that the world could be the world that is good for us unless we um, embraced a radical revolutionary notion of love. And, 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 you know, over the last few weeks, as, as we watched those horrendous scenes from Russia and Ukraine, and as we remember what's going on in Syria and in Palestine, and when we remember what indigenous folks experienced, and when we remember the Middle Passage, which, what she would argue is that a political solution is not sufficient. <laughs> that, that, that it is also important to do serious uh, self uh, reimagination and self love, which, in, imagine, which enables us to literally care for, and, and, she, and she means that care about, care about human beings. Uh, in the kind of beloved community way that Martin Luther King uh, asked us to to uh, embrace, she 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 was a little bit, and she she was frustrated by this uh, because critics sometimes say, "Oh, she's moved away from her radical politics by talking about all this love stuff," and she was constantly having to say exactly what you said that these are, these are connected. That her radical politics is kinetic is connected to her radical love talk and love vision. Are there any um, younger scholars or anyone you can think of who's carrying on the coattails, if you will, of Bell Hooks and her ideas of love and hope? Anyone you can think of? 
one of the things before somebody says something that I'm grappling with and intend to write about at certain point, um, part of part of 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 Bell's free woman and talking back self was her decision to decide how to depart this earth. Okay. Uh, Bell did not have a, uh, uh, Bell did not have a terminal illness, which uh, some people assume. Uh, uh, Bell chose at this particular point in her life not to um, engage with the medical establishment. And so I would say that, that, that her radical politics and her um, decisions about every aspect of her life, every aspect of her life continued through the end with her making the decision that this is how I will exit. Because one of the questions that, that I get a lot is because people didn't know, you know, until they read it that, 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 that Gloria had departed or that she had not been in good health and they wanted to know, uh, you know, what was the nature of her departure. And so that's something that I'm, that I'm um, and, I, and I think it also had to do with her spiritual, spiritual practice too. You mentioned something earlier, um, just a few minutes ago, really, that over the last month now, we have seen these images coming out of his brain. Um, can you speculate a little bit on, on how Bell would react to seeing these horrific scenes, and particularly how women and children have been brutalized in this process? So let me t let me tell you something that's very unusual about Bell. Um, Bell was did not have a TV in her house. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, uh, Bell was not on the uh, internet. Uh, Bell was not uh, even uh, on email. So she she um, made the decision uh, to to withdraw from. Uh, all of that and used to, and, and, and so she would, I was her, I was her little news, news source, uh, be, being the, being the uh, news junkie that I am. And, and I also, uh, because she mostly read books. And so the last year or two of, of her life, I would send her all of my magazines. And so she would uh, get it that way, but she, she was not uh, connected to the dailiness of news, and I think that that was also a deliberate on her part. I think that she she that that she chose uh, not to have the, the 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 horrendousness of 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 that part of life uh, interfere with her daily life. Let, let me just say too, she read up until she really got ill three to four books a day. And one of the things that we know about uh, tell uh, uh, meet the media if it will, it's a vampire. It will eat up all of your time. And so she, she, she read and she, she read books and wrote for most of those 30 years. And so her connection to the, 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 the media was very slim. So I think she would, she would have had a hard time uh, putting her eyes on, on what we're seeing uh, in the news, especially with her notions about uh, the kind of world that we should create. I think she would be appalled and maybe even depressed as many of us are. One one of the things you one of the things I, I don't I hope there are students in the audience. One of the things that I share with my students, and, and, and I know they just get sick of me. You have got to be a reader. You 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 have got to take responsibility for analyzing and understanding the world. And you can cannot do that if you live in chat rooms. And I use the example of 
bell hooks was who was the most voracious and committed and disciplined reader of anybody that I know. And she read broadly. She, she read self-help books. She read, you know, all kinds of, 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 of books she read. And so one, one of the, she was, she was my model in that regard too, that there, there is just no substitute for uh, love of knowledge. And, 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 and the kind of person that you become when, when, when you are constantly uh, evolving because you're reading, 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 reading. And so that's one of the messages that I have to my students. You, you, you've, 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 got to, you've got to develop an interest in reading. I mean, think about, about the Ukraine situation now. I mean, I spend my evenings trying to understand, I didn't, I didn't know very much about uh, the, the uh, Ukraine anything. So I've been reading Russian and Ukraine history. And, and, and that's what I think the, the, the bell hooks example uh, is with respect to books. And we know it's a tough call. We have a question from one of our professors here, uh, Dr. Marilyn Burkle. And she's wondering, even though you said Bell really wasn't into the news, how she would react and feel about uh, the nomination of John Duke okay. Brown. Yes, yes. Oh, I think she, I, I, th I think she'd be very thrilled about the uh, nomination of Katanji and uh, Katanji and 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 what I would like to do is uh, Xerox her some stuff and mail it to her, and she would read it. <laughs> and she would read. So she would say, "Okay, send me something," and so uh, she would she would get it through the mail. So yeah, I think she I think she would be very I think she'd be very happy. I think those hearings too reinforce again the, the male white supremacy yes uh, uh, patriarchy you know however you want to describe it that is still alive and well despite and show exactly we have to continue uh, within the struggle to try to challenge and overturn uh, and especially for our younger generation who may watch this and 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 really not understand it and the history behind it. That's why yes. what you said about reading broadly and staying somewhat out of, you know, Instagram and, and, yes. and all these things um, is, is so, so important with all the different things that are happening. A a absolutely. And, and, and she, she, would, she would absolutely use her white supremacist, capitalist, heteropatriarchal framework to analyze those, those, those hearings. I mean, it was despicable and disgusted the way uh, Katanji was treated by those mostly Republican white males and one Republican white female. And one of the things that Bell would say is, did the women's movement pass her by? <laughs> you know, you, cause, cause that, is, that, that is a question you would ask. You know, where, 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 where has she been for the last 50 years in terms of an intersectional analysis of heteropatriarchy and racism. You know, where were, where have you been, my homegirl, Miss Blackburn from Tennessee? <laughs> <laughs> and you know, and it's and it's and it's and it's that category of white women that uh, uh, we have tried to uh, have some impact on and have and have failed. Because one of the things that Bell Hooks would say is that race trumps gender in the US. White supremacy is so deeply embedded in the, in the, in the bone marrow of this country un, 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 until it's very hard for, for, for intersectional feminism to penetrate that. And there was no connection to Ketanji as a, as a, as a Black woman. I mean, you, you saw it. That's the that the, so so Bell would really talk about that. <laughs> I just have a last question. Um, how do you how do you talk to students who I have so many students who reject naming themselves as feminine? Yeah, because of the same things that you're talking about because it's got a. Um, what would Bell Hooks 
say about that? What would you say about that? How how do we kind of move beyond that label and, and talk about embracing that kind of the idea well, should, behind it? What she what she would do? I mean, that's why she wrote that. That's why she did the book Feminism is for Everybody. She wrote she she wrote that book. It's accessible. She wrote that book for the very reason that you mentioned. So 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 the so the people would not distance themselves from a politics that they really don't understand. And one of one of the things, and, and that's why I did Words of Fire, which traces, which traces African-American feminist thought from 1832 until the present. And I can I can I can testify that when students on our campuses take women's studies courses and get exposed to feminism, they move away from that when they realize that it is not white. I mean, some of the most brilliant, radical, transgressive feminists in the US have been black women. You know, going back to, Mar to, to Mariah Stewart in 1832. So I think we, we, we have to examine our curriculum and make sure that the, we are exposing them to the to to the to the books, the writings, going back to nineteen to the nineteenth century. I mean, you know, intersectionality has become a term now that's in the mainstream. And I would I would also say, even though I have some uh, some thoughts about it, uh, in many ways, feminism has become almost as almost an acceptable term because, in many ways, it's been stripped of its radical politics so that you have people saying well so and so is a feminist and i'm not going to call it call any names so and so is a feminist so and so is a feminist so it's not as demonized a category because popular rappers and young black women have said oh i'm a feminist uh so um but i just think i think that when we expose students uh men and women to the works of people like Bell Hooks. And I, even when I'm having arguments with people outside the academy, I just say, you know what, I'm gonna mail you Bell Hooks as feminism is for everybody and ask you to read it and then come back and we'll have a talk. Because most of the time they're talking about something they don't even know what it is that they're talking about. I mean, who, who could be opposed to the eradication of white supremacy? And who, you know, think about it. who could be opposed to all of those oppressions, which is how she defines feminism. Who, who, who could be opposed to, to, to um, wealth disparities? Who could be opposed to misogyny? So I think if when you frame it, it's not just about women's equality to men. You can, you can bring in a larger audience and people can, can uh, see that it, is, that, that, it, that it is a politics that will help change this world. I could engage you all night, but we don't have all night. <laughs> but I think when things um, clear up a little bit better, we'll have to bring you to campus. Oh, I, that's what I was going to suggest. I would, I would love to come to campus. Yeah, we'll we'll make the arrangement for that, so we can have you know a lot more interaction with our students. But we certainly want to thank you for your presentation and your insights on the life and times of Bell Hooks and so many of the other insightful things that you told us about. This was a very good dialogue, and I'm sure uh, our professors here and others are going to share this with our students, and they'll be all the better for it. So again, thank you. We look forward to uh, meeting you again and having thank another you. talk. And um, we'll uh, close the evening. And thank you very much. OK, and I will definitely come back. Thank you very much. OK. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>